Good morning, church. You all doing well today? Great for the lovely ladies. A little early Valentine's Day to you uh, from Pastor Pat. I think Josh said he was going to buy everybody a candy bar, so you can probably pick those up from him later. I'm just wearing a pink shirt, that's all. Hey, let me ask you a question. Anybody in here ever been in a hurry or busy? Maybe I should ask you this way. Is there anybody who would never has been in a hurry or busy? There's something about busyness and hurry that makes our heart spin. I don't know about you, it's like putting it on steroids and my insides seem kind of going like this. And just because of all that external activity and hurry and feeling pressure, get all that stuff done, my heart spins and my insides get like this. And you know, I really believe that is one of the great go-to excuses for Christians as to why we don't meet with the Lord, uh, why when we do meet, we're distracted, probably why we don't pray, don't have time to get into a Sabbath group, uh, don't stop to have significant conversations with others. The list goes on and on. But busyness and hurry so drives our lives that we just find ourselves out of control and unable to do the things that are most important. And I believe that when this happens, we're playing right into the hand of Satan. Listen to what 2 Corinthians 11 says. But I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, ah, I thought I could do it. <laughs> Your minds will be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. Doesn't busyness and hurry kind of push aside the simplicity and purity of just walking with Jesus as our hearts get all full of craziness? This morning, we're beginning a series that's called uh, The Unhurried Life. And along with this series, we're really jumpstarting our, our small groups, our Sabbath groups, and they're both really designed for the same purpose. You see, Sabbath is all about stopping and resting from the hurry and busyness to reconnect with the Lord and just refresh our own bodies and souls. And the goal of that time is really to connect with the real source of life, that's Jesus. Sabbath is a means to an end. Sabbath is not the end. It's not just about stopping so that I can be refreshed, but it's stopping, and yes, refreshment is a part of it, but the ultimate goal is to connect with the Lord, reorient to my life, stop, get a perspective again, where am I at with Jesus, and, and begin to walk out of that time with a new freshness for the next week of walking with him. And you know, we're, I believe that uh, we got a world that's fighting against us in that. Of course, Satan is the God of the world, so we shouldn't be surprised by that. And the world is always seeking to squeeze us into its mold. But hurry and busyness is part of what our culture in North America, especially in the big city, is a big part of it. I want you to hear what a few people have said about this. The impact of hurry upon our lives. Alan Fadding who wrote the book, The Unhurried Life, said this. Hurry is not a disordered schedule, but a disordered heart. To walk with God, you must go at a walking pace, or I will run past much of what God wants to show me, give me, and lead me into. Did you ever stop and think about that? Scripture doesn't talk about, people don't talk about running with God, it talks about walking with God. And if we're at a running pace in our lives, how can we walk with the Lord? And so, so many of us miss what the Lord wants for us because of our disordered hearts 
that are driven with hurry and busyness. Listen to what John Mark Comer uh, in his book, The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry, and he's the one that's going to be teaching us about Sabbath, said, hurry and love are incompatible. Love is painfully time-consuming. You know, guys, that is so true. How can you love somebody if you're in a hurry? And I'll tell you another thing. Hurry and busyness tire us out, and you can't love well when you're tired. You miss the opportunities because you just don't have the internal strength to do that. And so one of the things we got to understand about this hurry is it affects our ability to love well. Listen to what Corey Ten Boom said about hurry. If the devil can't make you sin, he'll make you busy because both sin and busyness have the exact same effect. They cut you off from your connection to God, to other people, and even to your own soul. I hope your heart's ringing and saying, yeah, because when I read these, I'm like, yeah, these are so true. John Ortberg said this, for many of us, the great danger is not that we will renounce our faith, but it is that we will become so distracted, rushed, and preoccupied that we will settle for a mediocre version of it. Wow. <laughs> so true. So true. And then finally, from a well-known international speaker, Pat Peglo. <laughs> PBP. For visitors, that's me. And I'm just joking. I'm not one of those kind of speakers. But anyhow, here's a problem that I found in my own life and maybe some others have found. Equating busyness with significance. The more busy I am and the more things I do and the bigger hurry, the more important I feel to myself and others think that I'm important because I just don't have time to do that and I don't want to interrupt you because you're so busy and you're so important and you're so insignificant. You know, I got to be honest with you. As I move towards retirement and I think about my future, I really struggled with this. And God really showed me something because I kind of felt once I move out of this busy, hurried, pastoral schedule, pray for all your brothers and sisters in the ministry because we have so much on us, we got to constantly fight that. It's almost like I feel like, well, I'm not of any significance or importance anymore. It can make any impact because I'm not going to be doing much. And God has really showed me that's a sickness of my heart. And there may be some others who feel this because I kind of felt like, well, I, I won't have an impact for the kingdom. I won't have a significant role in serving Jesus if I'm not busy and constantly doing things for Jesus. And God's saying, Pat, that, that's a sickness. That's just not true. You know, walking with Jesus, walking with Jesus at his pace <laughs> is where fruit is in its abundance. And so we're working in this series to try to get to that place where we can slow down and reconnect with God at a pace that he's walking. Um, I want you to turn to... 2 Corinthians chapter 3. We're going to look at a passage today that shows us the value of meeting with God. Now, as I say this, think this way with me, please. I just said the ultimate goal of Sabbath is really to connect with God. The ultimate goal of quiet time is not just to get into God's word and know more of God's word, it's to connect with God through his word. The ultimate goal of worship is not just to sing songs, but to connect with God and exalt him. The ultimate purpose of prayer is not to say my prayers and go through my list, it's to connect with God. So as we talk today, and in the series, we're gonna talk about more than Sabbath, we're gonna talk about a few other practices that can help us break this addiction to hurry and busyness our goal is, is to, I want you to think about meeting with the Lord through these different means. The disciplines, the Sabbath, the quiet time, the prayer times, the fill in the blank are the means 
to an end. The end is connecting with God. And what I love about the passage we're gonna look at today, it tells us what happens when we connect with God. Let me give you the context, 2 Corinthians chapter three. It's a passage where Paul's talking about that God has made us adequate servants of the new covenant. You guys who've been here understand the new covenant and the great value of it. We talked about it in the fall. And that God has made us the servants of a new covenant. And he's done that through Jesus. He makes us adequate to do that. Then he begins to compare the ministry of the old covenant, the Mosaic covenant, with the new covenant. And he's saying that the old covenant was a ministry of death and condemnation, while the new covenant is a ministry of life and righteousness. And then he compares the glory of the two ministries. The glory of the old covenant did have glory, but the glory of the new covenant so surpasses the glory of the Old Testament, it's almost like the Old Testament has no glory. It's kind of like holding up a 50 watt light bulb right here and then putting a thousand watt light bulb behind it. That's the new covenant. The the power of the light and the glory of the thousand watt bulb so overshadows the 50 watts, you don't even see it. And what he's saying is, is the new covenant is so glorious and so surpasses that of the Old Testament, uh, the old covenant ministry of Moses, that that's what it's like. But then he makes a switch in the middle of the passage in about verse 12. And he's gonna make a different comparison. It's a comparison between the minister of the old covenant, Moses, and the ministers of the new covenant, you and me. And guess what? He's gonna do the same thing. He's gonna contrast the glory between the minister of the old covenant, the glory that Moses experienced, and the glory that you and I experience as ministers of the new covenant. This is an amazing passage. When you stop and think of it, you're gonna hear today that you and I have a ministry that's more glorious and significant than Moses did when we bring the new covenant message to others. And guess what? We actually share in God's glory to a greater degree than Moses did. It's an amazing passage. You're gonna probably have to look at it later and read it again. See, that can't be. That's exactly what this passage is saying. And so what he does in this passage, he goes on and he he reminds them of the story of Moses. And, And If you remember, Moses went to meet with God on the mountain. And when Moses would meet with God and being in the presence of God, the radiance of God's glory would so shine on Moses' face that when he came down, he had to put a veil over his face. And the reason for that we learn here in 2 Corinthians, he says in verse 13, uh, we're in chapter three again, and, and we're not like Moses who used to put a veil over his face. Why? So that the sons of Israel would not look intently at the end of what was fading away. The glory on Moses from being in the presence of God was fading away and he put a veil over his face to cover that so they couldn't see the fading of the glory. But then when Moses would go back up into the presence of God, he would take off that veil when he's in the presence of God. Once again, he would get the radiance of the glory of God on his face and he'd come down on the same thing again. He had this shining face with the glory of God and he put a veil over it. I like to, you know, it's, I'd like to consider, it's kind of like he got tanned by the glory of God. You know, when we sit out in the sun and the sun on your face all day long. You come and the other day, your face is all red. Somebody say, boy, you've been out in the sun, haven't you? Well, I like to think of meeting with Jesus as getting a suntan, an S-O-N tan, because I've come into the presence of the Son of God, who is, happens to be the face of the glory of God, who is God's glory, that when I'm in his presence, the radiance of his glory shines on my face, and when I leave, that glory shows, but the good news is it doesn't fade away. It grows from one degree of glory 
to the next. So as we come back to this passage, we see that as he tells this story, he says, now Israel, even up until today, when they read the old covenant, they still have a veil over their hearts. Veils block people from seeing something. And, well, in the one case, it was used for Moses to block them from seeing in. In this case, God's saying this veil is over the hearts of Israel so that when they read the old covenant, they can't see the glory of God. But according to verses 16 and 17, I'll read this, you look at this as well. But whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil's taken away. Now the Lord is the spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And now we're gonna move into what we wanna do. That was all context. Now we're gonna look at today's passage, verse 18. But we all, here we move from Moses to Israel, to you and me who God has made ministers of a new covenant. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. What are you saying here? Remember Moses, he had to put a veil over his face. Why? Because people would see the fading of the glory. We don't need to put a veil over our faces because this glory increases rather than fades away. And when he talks about beholding the glory, but we all with unveiled face beholding as a mirror the glory of the Lord. This has been translated two different ways for years by good people, intelligent people, spiritual people. And I'm here to tell you today that Pat's not gonna give you the answer to the two different interpretations, but I'm gonna tell you my thoughts on it. There's one of two ways to interpret this. When he says beholding the glory of the Lord uh, as in a mirror, if you look in the context, he talks about Israel looking into words, God's word and there's a veil over their hearts so that they can't see the glory of the Lord. Then you look at the context afterwards in the next chapter when he says that all those who are not believers have a veil over their heart and when they hear the gospel, they can't see the glory of Christ who is the heart of the gospel. So the context before and after is talking about God's word and talking about seeing the glory of Jesus in his word. And so when Israel comes, they still have a, a veil over their heart. They can't see Jesus as the Messiah. And so contextually, when I look at this, I think, you know what? When we are looking in God's word, we're beholding as a mirror the glory of Jesus. But there's another interpretation. And that one, really, you can lean towards when you look at the tense of the verb, beholding. And that means that it's reflecting the glory. Just like Moses in the context reflected the glory off his face, and people saw it, but he had to put a veil over because it was fading. And so I see why people interpret it both ways. And I understand why I don't know the answer to it. But the reality is, is contextually by the word of God, it could mean we're beholding in God's word the very glory of Jesus as we're reading in this book. And that's what we really should be looking for as we're in relationship with him as we read. But it also could mean as we behold his glory, the glory of the sun is reflecting off of us to those around us. So I'm gonna give you my best interpretation of what I think it means. So here it is, I put it on a PowerPoint. As we behold the glory of God, that is see him in his word, our life is tanned by the radiance of that glory and we reflect his glory to others around us. You know, I sometimes think God intentionally, and there's other, Galatians 2.20 is one of those passages where God, I think, leaves a little 
ambiguity so that either one can be true or both are really true. And I think they're both true here. I think it's true that as we come to this book, and if we go beyond just studying the grammar and the history and the lexicon and the culture and all those other things, and somehow we get past that to connecting with our living God, Jesus, as we're looking at this book, we behold the glory of the Son of God. And as we behold his glory, something happens in us and to us that when we walk away, we're transformed and there's something about our lives. And guess what? When Jesus got a hold of your heart, it'll show up on your face. Now this may be a shock to some of you Christians. You might even smile once in a while because the joy of the Lord is filling your heart. And so I believe that what's happening here is that we all with unveiled face, we're coming in without a veil over our hearts and we're seeing Jesus as we look in the word. And as we see Jesus, his, the radiance of his glory is shining on us and we with unveiled face can walk away because this is what's happening as he goes on. But we all with unveiled face beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed, changed at the core of our being. We are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. We are actually being transformed into the same image of the glory of Jesus Christ because you know what God is doing. God, he has predestined all of us in eternity past to be conformed to the image of his son. Now, if you read into chapter four, and I love this because I will tell you this, we don't have time going to chapter four this week, but you should as you uh, look because chapter three and four are connected. They continue this theme about the glory of God in the veil. But you wanna know, I believe, because then he ends up and talks about how our afflictions are doing something in us that uh, renew us, kind of transform us, make us new, make us different day by day. And they're producing in us a weight of glory that there's no comparison to the problems and troubles that we're going through when we compare it to the glory that it's producing for us in glory, uh, in glory, glory and glory, amen. And so that's what the next chapter talks about. But in the middle of that, he says this. He talks about that God's using these trials to break down our flesh so that the very life of Jesus can be manifested in our lives. I think God's glory is manifested in our life, not because we start to act more like Jesus and think more like Jesus and talk more like Jesus, but it's because of the glory of God himself, Jesus is being more manifested in my life. And he has more control and more presence in my thinking and in my attitudes and in my actions. We're actually seeing the life of Jesus. As I, I, I like to say it this way, the Christian life is not a life of imitation. What would Jesus do? It's a life of incarnation. It's a fact that the spirit of Jesus has been born into our hearts when we were born again. And that life is further and further incarnated out through our lives as we continue to live as the life of Jesus is literally manifested in us. And the more his life is manifested in us, the more Jesus will be seen in my thinking and in my talks and in my attitudes and so forth and so on. And so, all this goes to say is this. Oh, by the way, let me finish verse 18. Uh, we're transforming this same image from glory to glory. Like I said, Moses, what happened with him? His glory faded away. The glory in our life is increasing more and more. And the longer we walk with Jesus and the more we meet with him, we should be coming more and more like him because more and more of his life is being manifested in our life, being transformed by his glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. All this is from the Spirit of God. So many people are trying to follow all the right steps and do all the right things to try to become better Christians and become more like Christ. 
Brothers and sisters, there's no better way than getting into the presence of the living God and trusting the Spirit of God to do something in us we could never do for ourselves. And that is to change us at the core of our being as much as a caterpillar, caterpillar is changed into a butterfly so that my life is not like the Pharisees who tried to live out the right stuff, but one whose life is so real with the presence of Jesus that the right stuff comes out of them naturally. You follow me? That's what happens when we meet with Jesus. This passage, and Ethan, you can head up this way, brother. This passage inspires me. And my guess is it would inspire you as well about the importance of meeting with Jesus, whether it be in Sabbath, whether it be in quiet time, whether it be in prayer, fill in the blank. I wanna tell you my story about, I think when I first came in touch with a believer with the impact of hurry and busyness in my life. Went on a mission trip to Montana um, we had two vanfuls of people from Moraine Valley, adults and kids. And we went out to help the hunters who, who work with the Indians out there. And um, at that time, I was a young father with three young daughters. Busy was all the young parents know what busyness can look like with young kids. And being a young pastor and in the ministry, busy with all the ministries. So I came out of that time going on this trip and even trying to administrate it with all the stuff you do, trying to put it together. I'm sure, Josh, you understand that from the small groups and what you're doing, trying to get all this together. You guys, thank you for your help and all the work that it takes. But you know, you're all jacked up. And so I, get, I got in the van and then, boy, I'll tell you what, the flu hit us. Could you imagine driving to Montana with kids with the flu? It had everything from both ends coming out. That was a fun trip. And uh, it, those who were with us, you can't forget it. But it was a long, smelly trip. But we got out there. And I remember on the first day that uh, Jim Hunter took me and Vince Galante up into the mountain area, he got in his Jeep, took us up there. We got up to the top of the mountain. And I remember Jim saying, do you hear that? I said, hear what? He said, don't you hear the breeze, the gentle breeze blowing through the pine trees? And I'm gonna tell you, I really tried. I'm like, ah. yeah, I just couldn't hear it. I could not hear it. But seven, you know, so we're there for a week and I'm out of the craziness of being in a big city and out of the rush of a schedule of a young parent, out of the rush of the ministry schedule. And I'm just there with people connecting with them and God and enjoying life. And at the end of the week, Jim took us back up. And when I got to the top of the mountain again, the same place, I immediately heard the gentle whistle of the breeze blowing through the pine trees in the mountains. The only difference is this. When I went up, my insides were like this. <laughs> you know, that's my insides. And when I went up the second time, I was like this. There was a quiet heart. My mind had slowed down. Everything stopped. And I could hear the gentle, quiet noise of the whistle blowing through the trees. And let me tell you something. There are many of us that are missing the still, small, gentle voice of the Spirit of God in our daily lives because we're so jacked up with hurry and busyness. And we're driven by this rather than led by the Spirit of God. Brothers and sisters, this is so important. We've got to deal with this as a church. We've got to deal with this as individuals. We need to be people that are not driven by the culture and what they value and what they believe and the way they live their life. We need, by God's grace, to break the stronghold of busyness and hurry in our lives and in our church so we can slow down on the inside enough 
to hear the still, small voice of the Spirit of God saying, this is the way, walk ye in it. So Father, I just pray for us. Lord, it's a strong, it's a stronghold. <laughs> I was gonna say that it's two different words, but that's one word. But yeah, it's a, it has a stronghold on us and it's a stronghold in our cultures, in our church, in our lives, Lord. And I wanna ask you that the Spirit of God would be pleased to move within this church and within this people, within this series, within these small groups. And God, would you break our addiction to hurry and busyness? God, I ask you that you would slow down our hearts to such a place that we can once again connect with you, Father, and to be transformed by the glory of God from one image into the next. And might that all be for your glory and for the benefit of those around us, I ask in Jesus' name, amen.